This is FRM Part 1, Book 3, Financial Markets and Products, Chapter 3, Mutual Funds and Hedge Funds. I'm guessing this chapter could be called something like, I bet you guys know a lot about these two topics. So let me see if I can add some value to your understanding of mutual funds and hedge funds. Here are the learning objectives for this chapter. We're going to differentiate between and among open-ended and closed-ended mutual funds, and we'll include ETFs in there as well. We'll look at the differences between hedge funds and mutual funds. We'll look at the net asset value for an open-ended fund, and we'll calculate the return on a hedge fund, um, including some, uh, some fee structure considerations. Probably my favorite part of the slide deck will be discussing and describing the various hedge fund strategies. And then we'll end with a discussion on survivorship bias. So let's go ahead and ask ourselves the question, what is a mutual fund? And this is in the context of differences between open-ended and closed-end mutual funds. And so this is the example that I give my students all the time. I say something like this. Suppose that I'm Jim and I'm a mutual fund manager, and I make a broad announcement to global investors. I say, hey, send me your money, and I'm going to invest it because I'm really smart, and I have access to capital markets that lots and lots of investors maybe don't have, maybe in terms of tax efficiency, maybe in terms of operational efficiency. Maybe I'm just a member of the New York Stock Exchange, and I have access to these capital markets. So what investors do is they send me all of their capital hundreds of millions of dollars, sometimes billions of dollars. Now, the cool part of being a mutual fund manager is what to do with all of that capital. And the answer is, well, whatever is outlined in the prospectus. So what I'm probably likely going to do is I'm going to invest in stocks and bonds. And when I outline uh, these objectives in the prospectus, I'm going to say something like, you know what, I'm going to invest in large cap equity securities or any uh, other of the host of different categories and asset classes inside of the equity world and inside of the fixed income world. So let's look at some of these uh, block points that are here. Pool of money collected from many investors where the funds are used to invest in securities. Okay, that makes sense operated by a manager and has a strict investment objective. I mean, let's face it, what I could do is I could ask you guys to send me your money and then every week I could just fly to Las Vegas and gamble with all your money. And at the end of the week, I might have zero dollars or my, I might have a lot of money. Now, of course, the SEC probably wouldn't be too excited if I took your money to Las Vegas, but that's the important point there. Strict investment objective means that whatever I say in the prospectus is the mandate under which I have to operate in terms of which securities to invest. Now, I don't have to tell you exactly which securities I'm investing in every single day of, uh, of the year, but I have to tell you what is the type of security. Now, inside of this uh, mutual fund space are these things known as index funds. And let's go ahead and face it that the, uh, you know, the guy from Vanguard 40 or 50 or 60 years ago, however long ago that was, boy, he was a genius to create that uh, Vanguard 500 index fund. And, and by the way, he was fairly criticized uh, back in 1970 or 1971, whenever that was when he started that fund. Um, because people said, why would anyone want to just earn the market return? Doesn't everyone want, want to beat the market? Isn't that what we were made of? We're competition. We want to beat the other person. Well, these index funds, of course, are so popular, and you guys don't need me to tell you that. Um, but what I think is fascinating is how the fund manager can go ahead and track a particular stock index. I mean, let's suppose that I'm doing Jim's uh, index fund uh, that's matching the S&P 500 index. What I could do is I could take your capital and I could best invest in every one of those 500 stocks in the exact proportion that is dictated by uh, the construction of that S&P 500 index. Or I could just take a sample and I could do all sorts of sampling strategies, or I could use index futures contracts. 
How about net asset value? This is really a simple concept. Net asset value is really just the price of the mutual fund or the price of the portfolio of securities. Of course, the term price is not used except for those closed end funds that trade on an exchange or in the over the counter markets. We'll talk about that in just a second. But think of the net asset value as the price of the portfolio, or don't use that word. How about just say it's the market value of the assets inside of that fund. Now they have to be adjusted by the, uh, the liability. So there's the formula in the middle of the page. I'm, I'm guessing you guys have seen this before. So you take the market value of all the assets and then you subtract out the liabilities, whatever those liabilities are, because after all, if I'm Jim and I'm running this mutual fund, I, I'm not doing it for free and uh, I have to pay for advertising, I have to pay for the uh, computing services, and I have to pay for me getting a hairstyle every day before I go on television. So all those liabilities, they have to be subtracted. And then we divide by the number of outstanding shares. Of course, the net asset value changes on a daily basis. And uh, these are required by the SEC to be compiled at the end of every trading day. So trading stops in the United States four o'clock. And so each fund manager has a couple of hours to figure out what that net asset value is going to be at the end of that given day. So what happens then is when you guys send me your capital or if, if you ask me to redeem some of those shares, well, the the amount that you receive or the amount that you send me it depends on that net asset value at the end of the day. Let's go ahead and zero in on the differences between an open-ended and a closed-ended mutual fund. What I pretty much described to you initially was, you know, kind of the characteristics of an open-ended mutual fund. If I'm Jim and I have an open-ended mutual fund, I say to you, hey, send me your money. Send it to me tomorrow. Send it to me next week. Send it to me next year. Whatever you want, just send it to me. And if you want some of your money back, I'll send it to you today. I'll send it to you tomorrow. I'll send it to you whenever. It's open. So the cash flows in and out openly. A closed end fund, on the other hand, is exactly what the name suggests. It's closed, which means that no new investors can participate. I mean, I'm willing to accept any capital from any person if I'm an open-ended mutual fund, whether they're a current shareholder or not. But a closed end fund, on the other hand, uh, is closed to new investors. Now, some closed end funds will allow existing investors to submit uh, some capital, but most most do not. And it's really fascinating the way this closed end fund, the closed end mutual fund universe has worked over the years. Some funds have been created with the idea that they're going to be closed after a certain time period, like 45 days or 65 days or six months or whatever that time period could be. And so during that period, you know, any investor can submit their capital and then it's closed. But a lot of times, uh, a lot of times fund managers, open fund managers, they they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And they said, you know what, I'm just going to close it to new investors. Now, that doesn't mean new investors can't participate in a closed end mutual fund. So what happens is that they go get traded over on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange or an over the counter market. I mean, this is one of the geniuses and of the financial engineers that are out there this closed end mutual fund. So they go trade on the New York Stock Exchange so that they're available to more uh, to more investors. Now, by far the coolest thing about a closed end mutual fund is that while it will have a net asset value at the end of every day, it's also trading on an exchange. So it's going to have a price. Now, what you would think is that those two prices are always going, uh, those two things are always going to be the same. The net asset value and the price should be the same, but there are a couple of reasons why, why this is not going to be true. So these, uh, these closed end funds trade at either a discount or a premium to their net as net asset value. So I have a couple of uh, flow charts there. So at the top one, what does that say? The investors buy shares into the open ended fund. Um, and then at the bottom, the investor buys shares on the stock exchange and an investor could sell share on the stock exchange. And there to the bottom right there is the open and open ended fund and issues the shares initially. And then those shares are traded, uh, traded on on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange or any other kind of an exchange. Here's a good table for differences between these two types of funds. 
And I think I've covered most of these things here. So subscription available throughout the years for the open-ended fund, only during a few days for the closed-end fund. Uh, open-ended funds not listed on an exchange, closed-end funds are. Uh, transactions are executed at the end of the day for the open-ended funds, but for closed-end funds, you can buy and sell these just like a share of stock. Uh, no maturity date for an open-ended fund, but the closed-end fund will have some period. You know, I have three to five years there, but it could be really any kind of a period. There's the premium and the discount to net asset value of the closed-end funds. And notice that the, uh, the body then for the open-ended fund, it can be growing over time if there are uh, lots of people submitting capital, or it could, be con it could be contracting if lots of people are asking for redemptions. How about exchange traded funds? These are kind of a, a relatively recent phenomenon and, and these are extremely popular as I'm sure you guys know. Um, uh, what these do is that these exchange traded funds, they can track an index or a commodity or a basket of assets. Um, and these ETFs are traded on an exchange, uh, but they're different from closed end funds in several aspects. I mean, the share price trades more closely to the net asset value. And there's a good statistic there. Among the largest ETFs, um, discounts and premiums stay within about 1% of the net asset value. Um, institutional investors have the liberty to exchange the ETF shares for the underlying assets. Sometimes they do this, a lot, a lot of times they don't. Um, unlike open-ended funds, ETFs are traded at any time during the day. They're more liquid and they probably have lower expense ratios. Now I want to swing back up to the second block point up there about the difference between the ETFs and the closed-end funds and why why ETFs have prices that are much closer to the net asset value. And um, it has everything to do with this concept of the authorized participant who is a really important person or institution. I mean, this is my, maybe a market maker or financial institution, somebody who has lots and lots of buying power. And so the creator of the ETF then hires, so to speak, an authorized participant. And the authorized participant is allowed to go into the market and buy if the prices are too low and sell if the prices are, uh, are too high to get that price more in line with the net asset value. Um, it has everything to do with arbitrage. And so those authorized participants and the way the ETFs are structured uh, make for that statistic there about 1% inside of that net asset value. Now, hedge funds, these, this is a cool animal. I mean, mutual funds are pretty cool, but hedge funds are, are even cooler. If I'm Jim and I'm a hedge fund manager, this is what I'm saying to you. I'm saying, here, send me your money, and I may or may not tell you what I'm going to do with your money. I, mean, I have a general idea of what I'm going to do with it. And by the way, if you want your money next week, that's probably not going to work. Uh, and by the way, you can't send me $3,000 or $1,000. You need to send me a million dollars or $10 million or $50 million. And so the hedge fund space is very different from the mutual fund space, even though, even though the general big picture idea is the same. If I'm Jim, send me your money, whether it's a mutual fund or a hedge fund, and I'm going to do a bunch of stuff with it. Now, I have tremendous, tremendous leeway as a hedge fund manager. So let's go ahead and look at this table here. Uh, mutual funds manager has lots of constraints. We talked about that. Hedge fund managers, they have much fewer constraints. They can use leverage. They can use short positions. They can use derivatives. Um, the paperwork uh, for the mutual fund, this is in a prospectus, which everybody can read. Uh, it's much it's much more secretive, and that's probably not a good word, but uh, uh, the paperwork is done through a private placement memo. Ah, liquidity. So uh, mutual fund managers are obligated to send their shareholders capital any time that they want. But hedge fund shareholders, they, they only get their money every once in a while. Now, if I'm a mutual fund manager, I probably don't have any of my money, my own personal capital invested into the fund. But with a hedge fund, I probably do. Advertisements occur all the time with mutual funds. Of course, you see them on television regularly. Um, 
And then there are some of the listing differences there. Hedge fund fees. Let's go ahead and talk about this for just a little bit. Of course, the hedge funds charge investors a higher management and operating fees, includes an annual management fee, typically one to 3%, an incentive fee, 15 to 30% of realized net profits. And so the idea is that if I'm a hedge fund manager, what I'm gonna do is that uh, while the mutual fund manager might be limited to this space right here, stocks and bonds, let's say, the hedge fund manager is not limited. And so this can go all the way out here to include things like derivative securities, to include leverage, to include things like alternative investments. You know, if I want to, if I want to take some of your money and go invest in an oil well or an apple orchard, I'm perfectly capable of doing that stuff. And so the idea is that I've got to do lots and lots of research and that I ought to be compensated for my time. And by the way, since I do have some capital invested, I might, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to charge an incentive fee. And it, doesn't, it, it, it makes perfect sense that shareholders would say, look, if you can generate a 50% return for me, then go ahead and take some for yourself. Now, a typical hedge schedule that reads 2% and 30% means that there's going to be 2% charge uh, on the asset base and then 30% of net profits. Let's look at a couple of definitions here. Uh, hurdle rate, this is the minimum return that should be earned before the incentive fees are imposed. High watermark, so this happens when the portfolio value goes up and then it goes down and then it goes up and then it goes down. And so it has to hit that, it has to, has to hit that high watermark uh, before those incentive fees are allowed to kick in. And then there's a clawback. This is an action where the hedge fund shareholders can, can take back some of those incentive fees to offset current losses. Let's go ahead and look at an example. Uh, we've got 100 million in assets at the start of period one. So that's time period zero. So at the end of period one, so here we are at 100 million. At the end of period one, we go up to 120 million. Then we go down to 90 million, right? And then we go back up to 140 million. If incentive fees are not calculated based on net of management fee, calculate the return to investors at the end of each period given a 2 and 20 fee structure with a high watermark provision for incentive fees. All right, so at the end of the first period, what happens? We, we bought at 100, we sold at 120. So clearly, that's a $20 million capital gain, right? What we're going to do is we're going to take 2% of the ending value, 2% of the 120, so there's the 2.4 management fee, and then we're going to take 20% of that capital gain. So 20% of 20 million, that's 4 million, right? So you sum those and you get, what do you get? 2.4 plus 4, that gives me 6.4 million in fees during that first period. And so the return to the investor is, right, what did we make? We made the 20, we need to subtract out that 6.4, and then we divide by the initial investment of 100. So that gives us 13.6 holding period return for that first period. Now, as you can guess, once we get into the second period, it's going to be a little bit more complex because the value drops to 90 million. So if we if we went from 100 to 120, then to 150, then to 180, then that fee structure would pretty much look the same in those kinds of calculations. But let's go ahead and look at what happens at the end of that second period. So what happened? Clearly, we went from 120 down to 90, so we lost 30 million. Our management fee is going to be the 2% of the assets under management at the end of the period, right? That 90 million, so that's 1.8. And there's not going to be any incentive fee since we're well below that high water mark of the 120. So the total fees for the period are going to be kind of, you know, kind of those fixed fees, even though they're 2% of the assets under management. You know, that's that's pretty much a standard rate. So what did we do? We lost the 30, then, then we had to pay the 1.8 divided by the value of the assets at the beginning of the period, which is the 120, so we lose during that second year. So think about what's going to happen. Let me go back. So we got 13% the first year, we lost the second year. Now, of course, what do we know? 
during that third period, we go from 90 all the way back up to 140, which is above the 120. So of course that return at the bottom here at the next slide has to be positive, right? All right, so what do we do? We go from 90 to 140. So there's a $50 million kind of a capital gain. We take the management fee, 2% of the 140, the ending balance again, so that's 2.8 million. And so now, now we gotta consider this high water mark. So what did we do? We had, we had the 120 oh, to the 140, so that's a $20 million kind of a capital gain for, uh, for incentive fee purposes. So we're gonna take the 20% times the 20 million, that gets us 4 million, so four and 2.8 that gets us up to the 6.8 million. So do you see how there are no incentive fees from the 90 million up, up to the 120 million? So what did we do? We made 50 million, we paid 6.8 in, uh, in fees, divided by the value at the beginning of period three, right, the 90 million, so that gets us almost 50%. Why don't we go ahead and do the three year holding period return and we can just kind of sum those things and we get, uh, we get 25%. Common hedge fund strategy. Here we go, long, short equity. What this means is that the hedge fund manager can maintain long positions and it, he or she can maintain short positions. Of course, I mean, the, the idea behind this is some, some intrinsic valuation model in which the hedge fund manager determines that one particular equity security is overvalued and one particular equity security is undervalued. And so you take the long and the short position as those, in, as those market values then move to their intrinsic value. I also like this dedicated short bias here. What, what this means is that uh, the total position, I mean, if you go back up to the long short equity, you could, have, you could have more long positions than short positions. You could have them offset each other exactly. Or if you have short positions greater than long positions, then this is a dedicated short bias. And this is probably not going to occur over a really, really long time periods, not even over long time periods, right? Because what do we know? Stock markets, they tend to rise over time. But in the short term, what the hedge fund manager is allowed to do is take advantage of overvaluations. I mean, this is really awesome. Something that the mutual fund manager is probably not allowed to do. Now, included in this strategy of a short position and the dedicated short bias is to invest in companies that are in financial trouble. So we look at these and call these an event-driven strategy. And what we're saying is that, all right, we have a company, well, and this company has a share of stock and has a bond issue outstanding, and those prices have fallen because of some event. So these are distressed companies and distressed securities. The question then is the following. Is this company going to rebound or are they dedicated to continue to fall? And so you identify these distressed companies and then through some intrinsic value or maybe relative valuation strategies, you determine if that price is gonna rise or that price is gonna fall. Of course, this doesn't sound anything like uh, something that mutual fund managers specialize in. Oh boy, then there's, uh, there, there's this uh, uh, search for arbitrage, and this can occur in almost any market, but um, there, there are some specific fixed income arbitrage strategies in which you take the long position in one bond and a short position in another bond, and that other bond has to be pretty similar. Maybe they have high correlations, uh, maybe they're in the same kind of a subsector in the financial institution industry, um, but whatever the case is, you try to buy these things so that their prices go like this. And when their prices go like this, you're benefiting because here, here you have the short position and here you have the long position. Um, here we go. There are lots and lots of securities out there that have embedded options, whether it's a call option or a put option or a conversion option. And so this convertible arbitrage tries to take advantage of discrepancies in the pricing of a company's convertible securities. All right, so what does a company do? It can issue a bond 
And if it wants to raise some extra capital, it can put a convertibility option inside of that bond, which allows the bondholder to convert those bonds into shares of stock. The idea is that the bondholders are willing to pay more for that conversion option. So think about what's happening here. You have a bond, which is trading in the fixed income market, that has an option inside of it, which could detach from that fixed income security and could, at least theoretically, trade over on an options market. And you have the equity security trading over here in the uh, floor of the New York Stock Exchange. So you got one market, you got two markets, and you kind of have three markets. And what you're trying to do then is to identify whether the stock whether the bond or whether the option is over or undervalued and to try to take advantage of those positions by, by taking the long or short in the bond or in the, sh uh, in the share of stock. Uh, merger arbitrage, this is really fascinating stuff because this is what we know. We know that when uh, there's only cl one clear winner in the merger and takeover market, and that clear winner is the target firm shareholders. You know, the average takeover premium is about 50%. So if you're a shareholder and you're tr trundling along at $100 per share and another bigger company comes and makes an offer, that price is going to be, that offer price is going to be, let's say $150. There's your 50% premium. So the target firm stock price then shoots up. But it's not going to go all the way up to 150. Maybe it'll go up to 142. Maybe it'll go up to 145. There's a discount in there. You know, some of it's timed, uh, time to the time value of money issue of the date versus the uh, you know actual merger date. But there's a discount because of risk because the acquiring firm could always just make the announcement. Uh, it could say something like, "Oh, sorry, we're faking you out. We're not interested in this target." Under which case then the stock price would then fall and it probably will fall to below that $100 uh, pre-offer value. And so what happens is that uh, because these acquiring firms pay such a substantial premium that their stock prices tend to fall over time. So you have a target, prices tend to rise. You have the acquiring firm, they tend to fall. So you can try to arbitrage those by taking long and short positions in those two firms. Oh boy, emerging markets. This of course sounds risky and, and it is. What we're trying to do here is identify emerging markets that are overvalued or undervalued. What this means essentially is a hedge fund manager who is a macroeconomic specialist to be able to identify these emerging markets that are undervalued and overvalued. And so think about what this means. The hedge fund manager has to be really smart or hire somebody who's really smart who, can, who looks at things like inflation and interest rates and political structure and employment and GDP and all that stuff to determine if an emerging market is over or undervalued. But the cool thing as the hedge fund manager, it really doesn't matter whether they're over or undervalued because you can take the long or short position to benefit. How about a global macro strategy? And this is guided by economic and political outlet outlook of a country. So the emerging markets are those, you know, those smaller markets. The, the global macro could be uh, any, any kind of a market. And then, of course, the most fascinating thing for me, if I were a hedge fund manager, would be to use derivative securities, take long and short positions on the futures exchanges, using swap contracts or option contracts. I mean, I tell my students all the time, I say, look, if you somehow had a time machine and you could go forward just one day, go ahead to tomorrow and tell me what LIBOR is going to be tomorrow at, let's say, two o'clock in the afternoon and by by two o'clock tomorrow afternoon using swap contracts, I could turn you into a billionaire, maybe a trillionaire. I don't even know what that means. All right, how about the risks faced by hedge fund managers? And so this should be fairly obvious based on our discussions. Liquidity risk, there's pricing risk, there's counterparty risk whenever you deal with derivative contracts or other kinds of contracts. There's that short squeeze. If we have all these short positions, um, boy, we might be forced back into the market. And then uh, as a corollary to the counterparty risk, there's that settlement risk. And these should be pretty self-explanatory based on those definitions. Um, how, how about this? When, 
think about the hedge fund universe and the mutual fund universe and any kind of a security like this, any, any kind of a universe. What happens is that bad companies, companies that declare bankruptcy, companies that no longer exist, they drop out. And so that's true for mutual funds and that's true for hedge funds. And so only, only the better managed funds are included in this uh, hedge fund database. And this is called survivorship bias because, you know, let's suppose there, that we start with a hedge, a hedge fund population of 10 and uh, over the next year, two fail. And then over the next year, three fail. So at the end of that, end of that second year, only five of the original 10 are still in operation. And then from that second to third year, let's suppose all five of those generate 100% return. So you can say something like, oh my gosh, hedge fund managers, they average 100% return, but that excludes the minus 100% return and probably even more because of all the leverage involved uh, of those firms that dropped out. I'm sorry, of those hedge funds that dropped out. And that takes us through our mutual fund and hedge fund chapter. I sure hope I added some value.